Hello there, this is How to Know a Time, a podcast about books and things. Hello everybody. Hello. Hello there. Watcher. Uh, yes, it's another book one. Uh, we've got, got, got my literary chums with me today and we're going to talk this time uh, about 2001's Hugo Award winner, uh, which this time it's, uh, forgive me, this is J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, uh, an, uh, an unconventional Hugo uh, nominee and winner. Um, <clears throat> which uh, won in 15 years ago. Uh, I'll read the back of the book. When Harry Potter wakes one morning with a searing pain in the lightning-shaped scar on his forehead, he is not sure what it means. All he knows is that the last time it happened, Lord Voldemort was close by. Three days later, the Quidditch World Cup ends in carnage at the hand of the Dark Lord's followers, and Harry steals himself for more trouble ahead. Back at Hogwarts for his fourth year, Harry is astonished to be chosen by the Goblet of Fire to represent the school in the Triwizard Tournament. The competition is dangerous, the task's terrifying, and true courage is no guarantee of survival, especially when the darkest forces are on the rise. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <clears throat> so then what follows is a quite a lengthy uh, a tale of, of wizarding daring do at the Hogwarts School for the Magically Gifted. Um, it, and also entwined is, is a quite a, a, a thrilling and a dark plot of, of evil on the rise and return. So, uh, Dr. Torag, hello. Hello there. So you picked this one out for us. Uh, yes. For which I'm grateful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how I, I, saw, I don't know what I was really expecting with this one. So why did you pick this one for us anyway? Then out of the list, well, it wasn't because of the back cover, which is <laughs> terrible. That the back, back cover is utterly I'm, dreadful. I know. I keep reading the back covers, and I'm beginning to suspect they're not written by the same person who wrote the book. Uh, that was exactly my thought. Yes. yes they're, they're, so yeah. okay, why did I pick it? Well, firstly, mm, mm. I'm quite fond of the Harry Potter stories and films. Mm. I just like the whole thing. It's just fun. Yeah. Um, secondly. I couldn't believe you'd never read any of them. And I had so never when read I Harry Potter until you, now. When I'd heard that you'd never read any of them, I really wanted to pick it because I'm fascinated to know what you think, okay. having read <laughs> this and none of the other. Because well, I, I can't a... get to that, you know. Yeah, uh... yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a Harry Potter virgin, as it were. I mean, I've seen, <clears throat> obviously seen some of the films because they're always on telly, on rotation, on ITV, pretty much every like bank holiday. Um, but the trouble is I've seen several of them and in different orders and, and I've have trouble trying to point out what happened in any of the specific one or what any of them were called so i was sort of kind of hoping that uh, i go at reading reading the thing firsthand as it were the, the originals might uh, clear some of that up for me so what did you make of it anyway terry obviously obviously you're somewhat familiar of this well i it, it wouldn't be the harry potter book give an award to I, genuinely, I don't think this is the best of them by a long way. So this is it's, what book four in uh, yes. seven, I think, in the end. Yes, that's. I believe that's right. And possibly stage plays and other spin-offs and things. Oh, as there's well. many other. Yeah. There's many bits. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's so, why we're measuring the books by kilogram or actual <laughs> identity. Yeah. This is a big yeah. book, actually. Yeah, I, was, I thought it'd be something a bit light, a bit fluffy. We can knock this out in a week or two over Christmas. I just <laughs> finished it today, actually. Um, I took a bit of time off for Christmas and stuff, but um, six hundred and thirty-six pages. It's, it's uh, a long for the record, book. the and audio book is twenty-four hours long. Wow. And, and I think genuinely yeah. that that's probably the biggest crime of this book. The first three books were a lot shorter, a lot snappier, and they, they were for children and children could get through them without, you know, stopping to grow an inch. Or yeah. Two, children could lift them. <laughs> yeah, quite. Uh, and this, I think, is too long. Um I, I like it, mm. but there are some bits of it I could quite happily do without. Yeah, so we were chatting a little bit before we started recording, and, and sort of one thing we sort of noticed, <laughs> John just shouted out, nothing happens when we when I was, I was trying to remember the plot. It, it is, there's a lot of plot, but not a lot of significant plot. I mean, base, so it's just sort of, uh, sort of, um, sort of, step through the basic uh, flow of what goes on then and correct me if i've got it wrong because there's a lot of a lot of names and and, and okay. places and and things that possibly i skimmed over a bit <clears throat> so so harry starts off the, the 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 tale after having defeated a whole load of evil stuffs in books one through three see previous installments he's he's at home with the dursleys and already i'm getting this this weird thing from this whole dursley angle so this is these these so his parents are dead famously and he's got mm -hmm. this scar because his, his, his parents were killed by this this Lord Voldemort chap, who sounds like a wrong one to me, uh, and he's and so he's basically living with who are the Dursleys? Are they is do they actually blood relations or something? Yes, sort of they are blood really relations. There, there is uncle or, and aunt. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
<clears throat> and, but they really don't like the magic thing at all. They they are aware of the masquerade. I mean, you've got this whole wizard society that are hiding, you know, who conduct themselves out out of plain sight of the real world, who they all call muggles, which is us. So this is all going. You know, the whole wizarding thing is a big, big secret, and there's a whole in, there's a yeah. whole ministry of magic and wizards living among us in in you know a bit like vampires basically. It um, always reminds me of uh, tourists being called grockles in the southwest, <laughs> Emmets or something in Cornwall. Yeah, um, and so. So Harry's sort of forced to live with these these muggle uncle and aunt who really treat him quite abominably. And I think I sort of picked up bits of this from other, other of the films as well. This is a recurring theme. And apparently book, by the time book four comes around, he's allowed to live in an actual bedroom instead of being kept at, locked up under the stairs. I mean, it's sort of the early parts of this sex, this thing sort of take on a bit like Roald Dahl. I'm thinking some of the sort of more absurd lengths that Roald Dahl's evil, evil stepmothers and evil aunts and things come out with in the kids' tales there. But then there's a sort of overtone of seriousness about it, which means you can't just laugh it off as absurd jokes you know this this there's this yeah. sense that this is actually a child who's being quite badly at least psychologically abused if not physically you know and this is how harry sort of lives his life when he's not at school and there there is a lot to almost all of it it does it does sort of make sense mm. i mean one of i can't remember which one it was i think it's the, the, the his aunt her sister was Turned out to be a a magic user, a magic user of some mm. kind, or, you know, a wizard or witch. Yeah. Um. And that was su a surprise to her, and her sister went off to this weird ass world. Yeah. Ca came into contact with this wrong and wizard yeah. and married him, and then everything went wrong. So it's obviously wizardry's fault that her, her sister was killed, and you know, it's all scary and nasty. You can see why they're not keen on wizardry. Mm. But it's sort of, I mean, it presents a kind of a weird sort of, uh, I don't know, a sort of. It, it, it's a book that seems to pull against itself in that regard, and this happens all the way through for me. I don't know how the rest of you chaps found it, but in the it's being portrayed as a kind of bonkers Charlie and the Chocolate Factory hidden magic. Look, oh, we're having a wizard adventure type thing on one level, but on another level, it's being written so sort of forthrightly and and realistically and well that it comes across as quite a serious thing as well. So there's all sorts of bonkers stuff going on that involve you know life changing injuries through mag through the misapplication of magic that are, that are quite horrifying and yet shrugged off and you know just a quick trip to the hospital wing of Hogwarts and off we, we're back into it again. You yeah. Know? yeah. And Harry escapes, all the way through. Harry escapes sort of mild to serious child abuse with his his real world relatives, and, yeah. and endures a year of mild of to serious child abuse in a boarding school. Absolutely, <laughs> failure I, I have duty this of care. Yeah, that the real world before they get to Hogwarts. It's not as clear in this book hmm. because they go off to the world. I do think first. I'm probably missing a lot of context but here. Yeah, there seems to be a different writing style for when they're at Privet Drive. Yeah, yeah. And it feels a lot more like uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and just that whole, or actually any of the other ones mm. more specifically, which is just, you know, that it, the thing that kids like, that whole everything's against the kids and, breaking it, the rules and having fun yeah that kind yeah. of thing and, and you know and, and the world's out to get you something that kids can identify with mm -hmm, but the yeah. moment it actually leaves it does this interesting turn where it does get incredibly serious it's, and yeah. people die it can't it's yeah. like it's almost like a book that can't quite decide if it's trying to be an adult thing or a kid's thing i, I think I, it's, I it's, it's, it's that deliberate yeah. i think it's i think it's, I think it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a warm-up it's mm. you know, this is the uh yeah you expect this to be road dull yeah, yeah. Maybe a bit darker, but Road Dolph on the modern age. And yeah, then, yeah. wow, actually, modern you know, here's fairy a proper book thing. for you. Yeah. She's yeah. intentionally starting to pivot at this point, isn't she? Yeah. She, she? She's aware her audience is literally ageing <laughs> as she goes, and she has to sort of follow and has the opportunity to develop and change. And that's quite quite unusual. She's not stayed in that initial genre. That she's something? actually migrated across. Is that something that's reflected across the whole range? Is the yes. Philosopher's yes, Stone do noticeably more childlike and lighthearted yes. compared to so. Deathly Hallows, I guess, which is the last one? Yeah. Is that very much more of a grim, dark kind of that is a grim full-on yes. adult thing? Yes. Yeah. And I think it was deliberate. That's interesting. Sort of written for that, it, secondary school kids. Yeah. So the first one was written for an eleven-year-old at yeah. the beginning of secondary school. This one, the fourth one's written for what fourteen, fifteen-year-olds. So you get the sort um, of you get the sense that the reader is essentially growing up with Harry through the series. Mm, that's that's, that's yeah. incredibly clever. If that's that was a deliberate thing, it's, it's, it's a, a benefit, done well. Yeah, the benefit she has by following the UK boarding school tradition is that people start in year one and then have seven-ish years of continuity, <laughs> as opposed to you yeah. know Buffy, where you've got well, was it three years of American high school. And then you're out. You know, yeah, you're, you're, it's much more self-contained those kind of uh, genres. Whereas here, she can she can tell that narrative and sort of retell that boarding school yeah. sort of structure. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it it sort of had a bit of an Edie Blyton high, you know, boarding school feeling about the Boarding school is quite an old fashioned sort of yeah, institution yeah. anyway, even uh, in the modern but I, world. It but... feels to me as if it's, Hogwarts is this protected space yes. where it's safer than it is in the rest of the magic oh, that's, world that's, or the real world. That's very so, much conveyed, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, you have bad things happen, but yes, they've got high quality medical care. <laughs> they you know, they will look yeah. after you. Whereas <laughs> they can cure when you hear about Mm. Yeah, but exactly. But when you hear about Neville Longbottom's parents, because yes. that didn't happen at Hogwarts, they yeah. were tortured into insanity. Yeah, yeah. And he's still suffering from that. And there's nothing in Hogwarts' happy-go-lucky world that's ever going to save him from that reality. So it's a sort of They're... refuge, but then opens up perils of another sort, I suppose. Yeah. With his parents, I really love the fact that they found out about it. Mm. You knew something had happened in the previous books, and they find out about it in this book, and they do nothing with it in the book. Yeah, It's yeah. just... No, this kid's a bit disturbed by the fact his parents were utterly, fi- utterly destroyed by yeah. the bad guy. Mm. And uh, that becomes a better... Uh, plot point later on. Yeah, there's but, some stuff that's irrevocable and 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 cannot mm-hmm. be fixed with yeah. a win- one or even the one. Bad yeah, things yeah. happen, and sometimes you can't just talk about it, and make it go away. Mm. So anyway, very early on, from from we get uh, the we get uh, the Weasleys into the scene. I like the Weasleys mostly, mm. um, so particularly Arthur and Molly Weasley. So this is Ron Weasley, who's who's Harry's best friend at, at Hogwarts. They're a full family of magic types who who do the entire robes thing and and don't have to hide in, in some suburban estate and live. In, in, live in horror, modern day real life, uh, child abuse or whatever. So they pick him up because he's arranged to stay with them for some of the summer holidays and they go off to the, the Quidditch World Cup as a big tra- uh, a big tr- sort of trip, for, a big treat for the family and everything. And basically they sort of function in a, in a surrogate family and I wonder why, you just, you, you think very early on, why isn't Harry just, just living with these people all the oh, time anyway? They do explain that in the books. Mm. There is a particular sort of in this system of magic, there is a protection that comes from being with blood relatives that protects him against Vold- Voldemort when he's out of school and in that. Uh, that wouldn't happen if he was staying with the Weasleys because right. he, they have no protection for him. Yeah, it's, it's a so remnant did of the explain backlash it. from yeah. them, his mother's protection uh, uh, against right, Voldemort. Gotcha. I, think, I think it explains that about three quarters of the way through. I think I saw something along the lines of that, but I'm not mm-hmm. quite following, I guess. but Because it, it is a valid question. It's a really stupid... Stupid. Why yes. is he living with these people? There is a reason for it. And you've got, it's not you've just... got the Weasleys, so I think probably about the only redeeming, normal, likeable family and adult Mostly. in the entire thing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, there's that, that one, <laughs> one grown son who works in the ministry who's a bit up himself. But oh, no, he's still likeable. <laughs> and, and Ron, of course, we'll get to Ron. Yeah. There's, there's, isn't there a, there's a dragon tamer, isn't there? There's yeah, one, one, of, one, one of the tames weird, dragons. He's got the ponytail and stuff. Yeah, can't in, in... you cut your hair? <laughs> no, mum. See, like it. Is, all, all the way through this, I was I was picturing Julie Walters and um, Thingy from the film because they, these are characters I sort of remembered and liked. Mm-hmm. But um, so yeah, you got this sort of family that sort of very fleetingly demonstrate that actually it's okay. To, you know, some some wizards are okay people and get on with get on with people and, and are nice and stuff. And, and then we sort of whisked away from that back into the peril as the, we get to this yeah. this World Cup outing. I saw, I saw a comment recently, because I do look at things about Harry Potter, mm. and it was a comment saying that the, the best thing about for Harry about being with the, the Weasleys is mm. not that they all use magic and it's a magic world and they all understand magic all or any of that. It, yeah. A really shocking thing to him was when he first went there, he came down for breakfast and were happy to see him and they talked to him at breakfast <laughs> yeah. and well, he's never it. encountered that in his you know in his all his life at home they treat I mean, him as a normal really, human being well, yeah, yeah, there's absolutely. a moment later on in the book where he gets hugged and it specifically yeah. says it's the first time he can ever remember being hugged yeah i mean it's sort of like i say i mean already at this point in the book i'm thinking yeah wizards whatever but just seeing some nice people who are nice to each other it's, it's already quite a, quite a massive contrast from the dursleys i mean obviously on purpose i guess but but yeah it's sort of shame to be moving away from that now back to hogwarts again again because i've sort of seen in some of the films already and it, that, that strikes me as a kind of quite clinical quite hands-off and bonkers kind of space where you know just weirdness happens all the time and and the, you could really do with just you know <laughs> be going to a day school instead perhaps and living with the weasleys or whatever so um yes yeah, so they got tickets. harry have you thought about giving up magic <laughs> <laughs> nice be, comprehensive it, it never ends well yeah no I, see i love hogwarts because it reminds me of school that that's pretty much exactly what my school was like. You had a boarding school background. Yeah. You're a wizard. Oh, 
and wow. I'm, there we go. No, Starting no, revolution. What the painting? <laughs> it, was, it, was no, it was more of a training school for spies <laughs> than wizards. Right. Okay. We're probably going to have because I've talked about this and it, 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 it we're going to have to bleep all like this out, or we're going to get black helicopters. <laughs> Let's move on. So, so they end up going to the the Quidditch World Cup, which gets built up such this immense thing, and then sort of is almost a nothing at all. It takes place yeah. over about one chapter. There's a lot of international teams on brooms flying around doing inexplicable things with bludgers it's, and it's, whatever. For me, it's one of the weakest two bits of the book. Mm, is the mm, it's built up World to Cup. a massive thing, and basically, I th- it's, it's notable most, mostly for the with the introduction of the Dark Mark. This uh, basically mm-hmm. after after all the the, the Quidditch happens um, out in the campsite. When incidentally, this campsite is about a thousand wizards all, all camping with barely cognizant permission on a Muggle's land, and then just mind wiping him constantly, men in black style. Which I nobody quite... said that the wizards <laughs> were the good guys. No, quite. They couldn't find a field or moorland of their own, so they. they they managed to sort of trick a, a normal into a normal farmer type into letting them have a festival on their land, and then they have to keep blanking his memory because all I like wizards to think can't that for stop the rest of his wizards. life. He has a twitch. Well, quite. But then at the end of that, you get a whole bunch of Death Eaters, and I sort of vaguely knew what this is. So Death Eaters apparently are the the sort of um, lieutenants and foot soldiers and followers of this Lord Voldemort chap. And they all go out and disguise and wear masks and are basically some kind of, I don't know, quasi-magical terrorist organisation. I'm not quite sure. Paramilitary types. And they basically start torturing the farm owner and you know, hoisting him in the air and you know, messing with his family and stuff. And the Ministry of Magic have to step in. And these are a bunch of absolute ineffectual nu- nu- nuisances as well. Um, and Standard this, British civil service. Satire, well, quite, yeah. quite. And it's just a sort of massive fiasco. Everyone's everyone's running around because there are big scary symbols projected into the sky. And there's a bit of plot there and a bit of introduction of various characters that we'll see later through the thing. And then after that, it's back to Hogwarts. And that mm-hmm. sort of whole section was, I mean, yeah, a bit of foreboding, I suppose. But I don't know. Yeah. I think the problem was they have described Quidditch in other books before this. And it can be exciting if you're mm. reading harry's point of view while he's playing the game but somebody commentating yeah. or watching somebody else playing it well i don't care who's going to win yes i don't care it it's it's got it's, yeah. it's the worst kind of watching sport you know uh, it's not the olympics I'm, I'm watching somebody watching somebody yeah. watching yeah. football yeah. oh god also quidditch is the worst design game ever <laughs> <laughs> So then after that, it's back to Hogwarts for the new term. Um, and there's, oh, well, I don't know, just, just a lot of not a lot goes on throughout this whole midsection of the book. It's a massive section of the book. And the main thing is this Triwizard Tournament, which is something that they haven't done for dozens of years because it's terrifyingly dangerous and people keep dying. So they decide to do it again, you know, and <laughs> Harry happens to be at school Surprise. as well. Surprise! Yeah, yeah. And they have this object, this artifact called the Goblet of Fire. And everyone who wants to take part in this 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 Triwizard Tournament, that's right, there's two other magicking schools from across Europe come. There's Beau Batons, which is some French outfit who come to, to, to take part as well. And also Drumstrang, which I think is in Transylvania or something That's, uh, and these two rival schools turn up at Hogwarts as visiting guests with their bunch of their classmates and they all have to put their, anyone who wants to take part in this tournament puts their name in the this goblet of fire and only only grown ups, you know, only sixth formers essentially, only sixteen year olds are allowed to take part. And Harry's only fourteen at this point, uh, and has no real interest in taking part anyway. But he finds it all quite exciting. And surprise, surprise, out pops Harry's name from the goblet because someone else has put his name in there to stitch him up. And I just don't get this bit at all. <clears throat> because you've got one noble designated major hero from each of the school and for Hogwarts it's not even Harry at all it's Cedric Diggory who's like some six former type <clears throat> who's uh, yeah, the, the big sort of jock who everyone everyone likes and admires and there's some contestants one from each of these other two schools and it's called the Triwizard Tournament and yet the, during the choosing out pops Harry's name as well as a fourth contestant um and everyone just goes, all oh, right, then we better put Harry through the challenge too. Mm, that and that I just... mandatory magic <laughs> contract. So what, I don't nobody asked, what? what would happen if he didn't compete? Why yeah. does he have to? It, yeah. it's, just, it's just a MacGuffin. It's just, he it's has just, to. It's just, yes, let's do because it. Because right. okay. yeah. yeah, It's just insane, absolutely insane. So we end up with Hogwarts with two contestants, which doesn't seem fair if, uh, apart from anything else, one of whom is two years underage and didn't even want to be in the competition anyway. But for some reason, I, know, I still 
I don't know if that passed me by quickly or there wasn't. No, it's, it's not but... explained what the, what the <laughs> rationale is. It's, it's magical. It's a magical contract. You have to complete that. It's yeah. the rationale. <laughs> because mm. Harry Potter, yeah. I mean, the, so the actual contestants and Harry then spend the rest of the year training for and taking part in these three challenges. They're so difficult and arduous that he doesn't have to do any studying or exams for the rest of the year. Lazy um, wizards. <laughs> no, <laughs> what's the thing? He has to do the lessons and he seems to have to do the studying. He just doesn't have to do the exams. Which is yeah, like, yeah. It's, 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 it's he's sit in the back and read yeah well presumably he has to spend three months you know a whole term each time trying to work out how to solve each challenge so then except he does well <laughs> yeah and he just does it well, Hermione does his homework for him. <laughs> yeah, and so Hermione stays left. I mean, I know enough about the series to know that Hermione's the real hero and does all the heavy lifting intellectually um yeah <clears throat> But so, yeah, so you have these three challenges take place. So the first one is uh, is dragons. They each have a dragon they have to steal an egg from, each of the contestants, and they go to all the effort of actually finding four dragons. So, you know, dragons, I've, I've played a game of D&D in my time, and they are pretty oh, no. high up on the table. No, no, dragons are around quite a lot. They're, they're dragons in Wales, you know. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I guess I'd know nothing because I'm a muggle. But um, so, yeah, Harry basically defeats, manages to get past his dragon by, well, for starters, he's shown that there are dragons and that's what he needs to prepare for by Hagrid uh, the night before or a couple of nights before. So, you know, cheats, basically. Um, and then he, I think he, they all come up with different techniques to try and get past the dragon. Dragons are quite magic proof, so they have to think quite hard and come up with cunning ideas. And Harry's is to just summon his broom and fly like a, like a flying thing over the top and past him and get the egg and hooray nobody died we got the first challenge um, done that's because he was by mad eye moody who's one of my favorite characters in the teachers he's just fun I, yes yeah, i forgot to mention him he's basically this year's new dark defense against the dark arts mm -hmm. teacher uh, and i guess that is a running gag because every film i've seen there's been a different defense against the dark arts teacher and at least 50 percent of them have turned out to be wrong ones mm -hmm. well they don't seem to be very good at defending themselves <laughs> against the dark arts when they are i'm guessing that's a <laughs> that's not a success gag. Is, snape wants the job every year and he doesn't get it uh right that <laughs> must be the thing yeah um yeah so so yeah he, he gets he gets he gets help and a nod and a tip and how to get through which i suppose doesn't seem unreasonable considering he doesn't want to be in the contest in the first place and is too young to be seriously c capable anyway so then you got the second test comes a bit later there's this magical egg with a clue in it and he takes it into the bath and it, it turns out to be a mermaid thing and and basically the second test is to go to the bottom of the lake and find something that's been taken from you that you treasure dearly and it turns out to be their, their friends um there's a whole <laughs> bunch of hostages down there yeah this one seems a bit harsh because unlike bit... the others where the contestant will die. Yeah, yeah. This is the contestant's friend will die. Test, yeah, contestant's best friend's down there, and basically, yeah. Without so opting and, in. But of course, to... at the end, you discovered they're all joking, and, and you shouldn't have taken it seriously. So, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so basically, Harry sort of essentially loses this challenge because he spends so long down there because he wants to rescue all of the hostages because one of the other contestants hadn't made it there, so there would be a hostage left over. So he, he, he spends a lot of time down there trying to work out how to free them all, uh, and so and he comes in like second or third place, but then gets bonus marks because of compassion or something there was some kind of moral lesson there i think um and then afterwards all these people are woken up so oh, we were just asleep and it was all fine and you shouldn't yeah exactly you know this totally undermined the seriousness of it all um and then you go on to the third task and the third task is this big maze and the, the goblet of fire is at the middle of it all it, um yeah to me that's the dungeon because we've had the dragons <laughs> yeah the dragons <laughs> Dragons, the underwater swimming, and the mm. dungeon. It, it the never caught level. on yeah, as the title of the game. Yeah. <laughs> surprised there wasn't a mandatory vehicle level there. So, well, I suppose the broomstick. At the, yeah. Um, yeah, so you get to the, the the last challenge is to get through this maze to the middle and to, to be the first one to grab the goblet of fire. And um, things start going awry at that point. And then at the end of this, and here we go. So this is the big spoiler, by the way, everyone. So if you are planning on reading it yourself, you might want to stop listening and come back <laughs> another time. But, no, it's uh, only you, it, it's only it's you it's in it's the own, world. Yeah. Fifth, this is 15 years old. I, I, I couldn't remember a lot about the uh, about the climax. I, I remember there being a goblet of fire and uh, and the bloke from Twilight dying. The bloke from Twilight, but, the, but that, was, that was about, that degree, was about think, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it was. I was quite interested as in how little I remembered from having watched the movies. <laughs> and, and I have read the book around about this time. I, I, I went books one through four or whatever, and I was amazed when it came to the climax how little I'd actually ever that had. Seen. I have vague memories of movie mermaids. I don't, perhaps I had seen this one and just don't remember it at all. 
because they're all very similar. It, it's I don't odd, know. but nothing happens in this book, and yet the movie has to cut bits. <laughs> mm. yeah. um, I, I, I remember a thankfully legal Harry Potter in a bath, I think, uh, mm. at that point. It was a rather confusing moment on the, on the, on the movie. <laughs> How should I be feeling about this? I don't know. It's, 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 it's disturbing me. Go away. <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically, there's a lot of lot of ructions in the maze, and ultimately, Cedric Diggory, yeah, the bloke from Twilight, and Harry get to the goblet at the same time, and and they decide. I think Harry saves him from something or other, and then they decide to grab the goblet together to be joint yeah, hero they've winners. Been, they've been to promote. The... Oh, I think you're going a bit choppy gave... there. <laughs> they've been together for most of the competition. Mm, sort of neck and neck because they've helped each other. You know, yeah, he warned they're... him about the warned him about the you know they 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 helped each other a bit so they're decent Diggory is not a bad guy he's not a villain by any stretch no yeah no, he's he, a friendly even though, you know he's he's obviously you know he's he's not a gryffindor so he's obviously a wrongen i think he's what he's puff puff good guy yeah yeah yes yeah, yeah, so they're completely useless known house. to mankind uh, they're, they're badgers <laughs> hufflepuff is badgers uh, yes I, I yeah you're just losing me now um, sorry Huffle, hard working type Hard who, are, who were neither Diligent. brave, neither brave, uh, acquisitive, or uh, intelligent. So, so we call them scenery. <laughs> they're stupid, <laughs> cowardly, and, and they're, they're the idiots who really... stay home, do their homework, and, and, and keep their nose clean. It's like, they're the... <laughs> so Gryffindor's basically the hero house because that's where Harry mm-hmm. is. Then you got Ravenclaw, Ravenclaw or like Claw Brainiac the study types yeah. or go far in real life. And then you got all the evil wrong ones get put in Slytherin, yeah? Yeah. Right. It's gotcha. kind hearted Hufflepuff, that's it. That's uh, the attribute, is it? Is, is compassion, isn't it? <laughs> Something to do with a sorting hat, I understand. Anyway, so they grab the cup, and the cup turns out to be a port key, which is like a high-speed tran- mass transit device the wizards use for teleporting around the place. And they... Chekhov's cal- teleportation device there. <laughs> mm. Yeah, exactly. And they both get whisked somewhere very far away to find that Lord Voldemort has captured them both uh, and has captured Harry and then uses some blood from him and a bone from a grave and, and an arm from, from Timothy Spall, I think, um, and basically manages to rejuvenate himself into full Ralph Fiennes. Um, I don't, yes, it's, it all got a bit confusing at that point. And it turned out the entire Goblet of Fire thing was just a massive ruse to get Harry out of out of Hogwarts so that mm-hmm. so that Voldemort could use him to do some kind of rejuvenation, regeneration Doctor Who master thing. Because he needed blood of an enemy. Blood when, of an enemy. Um, Lord, you're Lord Voldemort. Thank you goodness probably he doesn't have, have any quite yeah, a lot of yeah. enemies in the Wizarding Everybody World. Everybody else. Everyone else in the yeah. Wizarding World is too terrified of him to say his actual name. They keep calling him you-know-who. I think only Dumbledore and uh, Harry actually use his full name properly. I, I was getting Wheel of Time flashbacks at that point. Because <laughs> the, 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 the Satan character there is referred to as the Great Lord of the Dark. And, and every time you refer to his name, people say, Don't use his name! <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, I wonder where J.K. Dark. got that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, maybe there's some sort of superstition that he can hear you if you say his name or whatever. I don't know. But but I think they actually later on in this, they there is a they work out that yes, using his name does get people to hear him. Mm. Or he can hear hear anyone mention his Uh, name. Which which wouldn't work if everybody mentioned his name, because he'd just get drowned out by the staff. All the time. That's the way to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Blimey. So yeah, then so but this yeah, he, takes he's, place. he's a bit weird. Voldemort is obsessed with Harry Potter, which yeah, is why he yeah. wanted to get I mean, him out. Of we this. are well into self-destructive, obsessional, evil overlord territory here. I mean, he, there are so many points that I'm thinking just just kill him just don't know because he does the ritual and then then in a fit of evil peak he releases harry gives him lets him get his wand out and tries to attempts to duel him um, i should dem- demonstrate my my magical su- uh, moral superiority by lecturing the good guy yeah, and, yeah. and uh, giving the off good guy an opportunity not to die when did that ever go villain, wrong yeah um but not before he's man he's, he's just he's just summarily executed cedric diggory as well he just kills him there and then which is quite dark i think i thought mm. this has taken a, a grim turn but he didn't um, like Twilight either, so mm, yeah, well, quite. Um, so uh, yeah, and then there's some weird thing happens with the wands, and it's later explained because the wands have both got the same core they Which, interact yeah. or something. And Which that they mentioned up... four books ago. Yeah, so. if you cross <laughs> the stream, it yeah. all goes horribly wrong. So they cross the streams and ends up summoning the last eight or nine people Voldemort's killed in shade form to distract and, and help Harry escape. And he, which he then does, he manages to grab Diggory's body. It should be pointed out that two of them in the wrong order as well. <clears throat> I don't know what's going on at this point, to be honest. Uh, and they managed to teleport back to Hogwarts, uh, where the the massive expositional reveal section happens with Dumbledore. Um, and the, the reveal is 
so, so tenuous. I totally didn't see it coming. I mean, perhaps that means I was bamboozled by a book aimed at 12-year-olds, but did any of you get, guess? The first time I read it, I was surprised by who turned out to be the bad guy. Yeah, because I think the, they gave you the mole inside Hogwarts. Yeah, they yeah. gave you a lot of plausible candidates. Yes, yes. It isn't just, there was two or oh, three levels of red herring, and I didn't go yeah, for the obvious no, one. Absolutely. It's obviously not Snape, you know. Yeah. And then I because I, I ended up settling on Ludo Bagman, the big sort of mm-hmm. bluff ex sports guy who's the commentator and who was all through the book desperately keen to get Harry to help Harry with anything he needs to get to get through and win and stuff. And that all turns out to be because that was just because he'd bet on Harry and had some gambling debts he wanted to pay off. So it wasn't him at all. And it actually there, there are three or three or four alternate versions of this book where where you know one of the other major characters turned out to be and there's a compa- and it's all they're all perfectly plausible I think okay so I, the, I quite like hmm. the idea of there, there's a nice uh, diversion that's used in there of character having the same first name as his father yes yeah. and I really like that because mm. you think it's the father but no actually it's the son I think that was necessary because yes. the magic yes. map that, that mm-hmm. always tells yeah. Yeah. Harry where people are in Hogwarts and what their names are and that but that, it, that ends up being used yeah there yeah. that's, that's, that's classic super, Superman kryptonite problem isn't it you, 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 you've given the um, the party a, a magical Ultimate ability surveillance. you must yeah. now write in a reason and, 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 and have a reason be fits. they've got the same name yeah. as a one but they've done really well with it. that because it all fits mm-hmm. together that having a different Barty oh. Crouch yeah yeah is a brilliantly yeah, I'm not going to say it, it, like it. it does fit and, absolutely but it's it just also so shows, tenuous but it also shows that you can have someone who's obviously the bad guy he's there's no doubt about it he's a bad guy from start to finish mm. you know he's the rotten one yeah. and then it turns out no he's just in debt and you think oh right okay uh, so, yeah and I like that if you're having this book for kids Having several bad guys, some of whom turn out to be pretty much entirely innocent, mm, is a mm. really good thing to think in. I, I suspect at this age. I suspect that at different ages, kids are going to think different things. They're going to always mm-hmm. going to start with Snape being the bad guy because he's Cause, such a sort of pantomime villain most of the way yeah. through. He's just mean to Harry. He wears black. He looks sinister. You know. Look at his lank hair. He's yeah. clearly the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he does. He does poisons for for a class. You know. and, and haven't you heard? He's it's the head Alan of Rickman in, in the house. film. It's bound yeah. to be bad. And is Alan Rickman? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, I I still don't quite get the overall meta arc for Snape there. I guess I'm going to have to read all the other six to find um, out. No, there is what, no. You should be able to get it from this book. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some kind of sort of spy or turncoat or double agent thing about Snape. But anyway, so the, the, okay, so the actual villain in this one, it, it turned out to be not Barty Crouch. So Barty Crouch is this sort of officious civil servant type who's in charge of the the international magical cooperation thing. He's in charge of organising the, the big thing, and he's he's this stern, non, no nonsense type of uh, dark wizard fighter throughout. And then he goes missing halfway through, and then there's all sorts of we sort of see him degenerating a little. Yeah, bit. He's, he's, he's looking he's a bit unraveling. Bad, and then, and then Ill, bit, looking then. potentially a bit evil and so you think well, it might be him but no actually it turns out to be his son who actually you thought had died in prison well before the start of this book his son was convicted of being a death eater well well before the events of this book by his own dad his own dad put him in the slammer and stuff and so that sort of explains his his you know, terseness and so on but then what happens is his mother goes to prison to visit him and takes a polyjuice potion which is like this ultimate shape change thing that makes him makes you look like someone else as long as you can regularly get bits of their hair or something and then takes so his mum takes his place in prison and stays there and dies in prison so that the son can escape the son is then in sort of kept in the house and under an invisibility cloak and under the sort of auspices of this house elf for a for like a decade or something and then manages to break out and make himself available to voldemort then uses the polyjuice potion to replace moody mad dog mm-hmm. moody the defensive dark artist stop if i'm getting this wrong everyone but no 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 you're no, right no you're right this, he replaces dark mad dog moody at the start of the book well yeah before he even starts teaching defense of the dark arts and, maintains and the masquerade for a whole year including teaching a whole course at a school well just he knows so he about can, the dark arts to be fair well yes so certainly it's just so that he can set this thing up with the cup at the end of the year and in the meantime he's keeping the real moody stuffed in a sort of bag of holding type chest for like a whole year just so he can keep getting samples of hair to keep the, the illusion going insanely complicated and I just, I just came away from that thinking, well, uh, okay, technically you've ticked all the boxes, but really, I don't know. I, don't, I just found that quite. See, you've got a kids' book. Well, yeah, but yeah. For me, the one shame about that, really, really, really liked, 
had a very moody character throughout the first three quarters of the book. I thought he was a. It's nice to have somebody else who we haven't seen before who's interesting. Yes, and I mean, then the character and presented then the to us as liked, moody is, is yeah. good. He's, he's like he's quite a rambunctious, person... no nonsense. You know, keep an eye out; they're all out to get you. Type <laughs> type. Uh, you know, he's, he's definitely a, a good is not nice type character. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to have a competent, you know, evil fighter on the side. Yeah, because there, there were two characters, weren't there, who were trying to help Harry uh, with the challenges. Yeah. Of our subterfuge. There was the there was the the the, the, the nice inept evil guy who was yeah. just who was being blackmailed by the goblins or whatever. And yeah. and then there's Moody's character who also was trying to slip Harry little pieces of note to make sure that he was there and he makes sure Harry put his and he hand, was the one that was actually doing the hand setting on the, up yeah. on the port key. And yeah. he does this big exposition at the end during the reveal when he's got Harry. You know, there's a sort of after the end of it all bit where he manages to get Harry alone and there's a oh no, you know, threatening bit. But and he he just goes on for about two or three pages bang hanging on about how stupid Harry was and how much help he had to keep giving Harry all the way through. And See thinking, how clever I have been. you've got yeah. a point, though. Harry doesn't really do an actual lot for himself in this book. I mean, mm. you know, aside from Hermione's constant assistance, he, he doesn't really, you know, there's so many hints and tips and help that gets given to him. The business with the gillyweed for the underwater thing, that was that was set up by Moody, or Stoke, um, Barty Crouch, whatever. <laughs> so you just sort of left coming up from the end of it thinking there was a massive evil scheme there that actually worked because um, Voldemort gets resurrected at the end of it all. It doesn't the, quite kill the, Harry. The bad but guys won in this. The bad guys won. Mm. It's a sort of Empire Strikes Back feel to it all. And then there's a big monologue in exhibition at the end pointing out, ah, you're so stupid, hero. And actually, you're right in this case. So yeah, there's, <laughs> there's two cackling monologues, aren't there? There's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's Voldemort's, Voldemort, from which Harry escapes. Yeah, and, giving... and, and then the second one from Barty Crouch, which. Harry escapes from because he's saved by... Um... Well, yeah, but also there's no way that Barty Crouch is ever going to kill him because the big bad guy won't let any of his subordinates kill Harry because yes. it's got to be yes. him. No, he kills going. the hero but me, except I'm not actually capable yes. of it because every time I'm faced with a hero, I talk at him too much. You know, that first <laughs> sign of incompetent thing. management of the force oh, of darkness. Delegate, so. delegate Voldemort. Just I will, I will use a spell against him, but oh, maybe the bounce off or my wand will get stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a bit of an idea failure there glitched. as well. Sorry. Voldemort doesn't delegate because he doesn't trust any of his subordinates. Because uh, who's he got? He's got all the most untrustworthy um, scum in the universe they're all wrong, working yeah. for him. Of course, you wouldn't trust them. They're either incompetent or evil. Which mirrors rather well into um, into the forces of good because um, Dumbledore Dumbledore's practically primary character trait is trust. Is, 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 is compa <laughs> compassion is exactly yes. the opposite of Voldemort. Yeah, which is demonstrated with the whole Snape thing there. He's obviously mm -hmm. clearly giving Snape some kind of second chance thing going on there, which is why he trusts Snape when no one else, including the reader, does. <laughs> so, yeah. Ah. So yeah, I think I got there in the end, but it took mm. 630 pages to get there, and I, it, I don't know. It didn't need to. There's a lot of meandering. I mean, I <laughs> suppose it's, oh, it's got oh. a lot of structure. The book, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's, it's, it, you can see right. Here's the prologue. Um, yeah. Here's here's the bit before they go to school. Right now, there oh, some Quidditch because we we got to have some Quidditch in because people <laughs> will cry if there isn't any Quidditch. Mm -hmm. And then for the rest of the book, there's no Quidditch. Yeah. And, and then you've got the you know term one, term two, term three, all all the cl calendar events. It it it. it cl Ticks by literally like clockwork. You know, the yeah. calendar a year out Hogwarts, which happens this year to have and, some murderously mm -hmm. insane competition mm. going on, but it, it's still a year at school nonetheless. So she got she's got that driving the structure, which uh, which effectively happens in all the books, doesn't it? You know that that mm -hmm. that's, that year term does sort of that the passing of time. It is part of the of the sort of the charm all of the, the films. Books. I remember and, it is they are structured around a year at school. Yeah, and time is running out. To, tick, yeah, tick. and you get the year by year development because in this you've got the Yule Ball, which oh, is gosh, the other yes. bit where wow. I really can't tolerate <laughs> that chapter because yeah. teenage boys mm. are the most unforgivably noxious and <laughs> incompetent and useless excrescences on the planet. Oh, do we get to, and you about get Ron to again? see yeah, Well, not just Ron, Ron both Ron not and just Ron, no. not Ron and Harry are both inexcusably rude. Just, just stupid, useless wastes of He's space. He's sort of teetering on the uh, girls sort of age. Yeah, exactly. They are But at age. the same time, but they're getting to the point where they're starting to be expected to do social functions and things. And so, yes, basically, when Christmas comes around, all those students staying on over the Christmas period, uh, they, they all get to go to a big grand 
ball and they have to ask a date and stuff and do dancings mm -hmm. and things and particularly harry because being one of the champions of the ongoing try wizard nonsense they have to do the first dance and so they, you know there's a big there's a big prestige yeah, to, yeah his, his attendance on a whole bunch of things is mandatory and i'm just wondering is that part of the magical contract you know, will, will something terrible happen <laughs> What's if he doesn't going on? i'm feeling a bit ill yeah. i'll be in the bathroom six hours later emerges oh, it's, it's uh, really harsh embarrassment it's really harsh assuming they're going to give up christmas with their parents all these people well, just because there's a ball yeah well i think it's no, no hardship for harry who clearly doesn't want to go it, home it mentions isn't it that, that ev almost everybody stays normally harry's yeah. alone at christmas but because of the excitement of the of the tournament everybody stays in. how many ruined oh. christmases were there? <laughs> timmy's not coming home for christmas he's staying at that weird magic place but he's probably difficult. going up with no bones yeah. in his arm <laughs> But it's difficult to be rooting for Harry throughout this book when there's one chapter where you are really, if you're rooting for Harry, you're you're a wrongen. I'm afraid there's no way you can be on Harry's side during the ball. He's in. He's just oh terrible. That whole, that whole section. It. I don't know. In one way, it felt. It felt good. It felt clever because what you've got there essentially is is you know we're going to take time out of this ongoing peril of mayhem to to examine what life must be like as a fourteen year old boy. You know to try and connect with the target demographic, I suppose. You know, but as it, it, as, it as a sort true. of forty something adult reading through there, that was quite hard going. You know, but, it, 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 it does. But it does feel true. But yes, it's there's a sort of authenticity to it. Yeah, absolutely. But it's but difficult. It's not like you could have written something that was uh, better writing and and less wincing, but still. <laughs> spoke to, it, 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 yeah it was yeah. it wasn't very elegant and it was a bit painful and mm. i wish she'd written it differently the whole thing there's sort of moments throughout where it, there's, there's definite nods to trying to connect with what you know being a teenager and growing up and being at school the, the sort of day-to-day -day normal problems alike i suppose but it's very difficult to let that sink in or go anywhere with that when you know a scene later they're trying to fight off giant scorpion things that explode as part of their woefully under uh, managed uh, care of magical creatures class yeah it, it's the, the 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 gender relations in the book i mean yeah the mid-teen years mm. gender relations mm. gender relations profoundly confused full stop yeah. but and you've got the boys being obnoxious but there, there are kind of our you know pov character and our kind of our champions and you're kind of meant to root for ron and harry obviously <laughs> and, and hermione is, is obviously she is the she is the paragon um <clears throat> uh, 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 she, she's the only useful character, the only one with her yes. head screwed on, the only one who sort of cares genuinely about stuff rather than egos. Yet in the background, you've got you, you know all, all the female, most not not all, but most of the female characters are presented as 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 forgive me, sort of titter, titter, tittering clouds of 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 schoolgirls chasing after Cedric Diggory and the yes, from, from, from Twilight. It's as a kind of hunk, yeah. And, and... It, 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 that just keeps happening. The 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 Harry Potter being. Being poked and poked and prodded by this by the girls in the background, and 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 it just felt it just felt odd the way they she was sort of you know getting the gender relations. It felt it felt like there wasn't as much compassion as there could be. It's it's kind of realistic, but at the same time, I just came yeah, out of it feeling yeah. a bit uh, could be better but, somehow. Yeah, it could I be agree, a better but, story. But, it could be a better but, narrative, even if it's quite as you say I, realistic. I think that this that bit. In, and the uh, Rita Skeeter bits are probably both informed by the increasing celebrity of J.K. Rowling. Mm -hmm. She really, by this stage, hates journalists. Yes. So the Rita... th there is a lot of mm -hmm. effort put into how much you're supposed to hate that journalist. Yeah, the Rita but it's also Skeeter character... the celebrity thing and how to react to celebrity yeah. is in there as well. So basically, throughout this the year of this Triwizard Tournament, you've got this hugely obnoxious, intrusive, and you know the worst kind of paparazzi reporter woman called Rita Skeeter, who's basically just going around asking people for out of context quotes and then fabricating all sorts of slander and gossip about them in the the Daily Prophet, I think, is their wizardy mm -hmm. newspaper, and that sort of goes on throughout the year. And there's a sort of side plot where Hermione eventually gets her own back on this 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 woman, but it all feels a bit. <laughs> it's like, and this happened as well, and you're thinking, oh, okay. You know, sort of, I'm, I'm a bit distracted by the the mortal peril and Voldemort thing. You know, I don't know. A, a lot of it because because you've got that strong um, strong scaffolding and time is passing and oh here's Easter. Mm. Um, a, a lot of it 
some of it felt to me like it was permanently on the montage button. You know, she, she didn't actually yes. have to link a lot of the elements together. You, she she could drop sort of you know and if, and if, you know some interesting herbology and uh, some interesting <laughs> dark arts and some interesting potions. She could just sort of smatter that kind of character development across the year. And 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 you always had the excuse of you know, time passes and here's another event. She didn't actually have to yeah. structure the rather that, that scaffolding gave you automatically a sense of of place and stru- and yeah. And, didn't and really progress. Have to spell it out quite so much, perhaps. And and, and yeah. just just and just suddenly the characters are, are somewhere else, and suddenly you know you resolve that emotional note, and 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 it moves on. It, it, it's <laughs> it's it's very different having that kind of boarding school um, structure. It it's very very. I mean, I, I think they were they were a lot more popular. You know, Billy Bunter and the X <laughs> kind of it, stuff. It does feel sort of old fashioned. Yeah, I mean, there are mm-hmm. occasional references to modern day life and so on, but most of it goes on in the Wizarding World, which is it, it seemingly stuck somewhere in the nineteen twenties anyway. The, and, the, this rich golden world service, yeah, and park and where, yes. and, yeah, which I suppose everybody is a sort of comforting behaved. kind of thing, but. But yeah, but if you've read all the books, you will find that most of the characters in this. Firstly, they've got seven books that describe them. They do hang together pretty well. What they do make sense. If it, get, it might not yeah. to you because you've only read this well, one quite, book. I get the whole but out of these personalities and characters are consistent, and when they change, it makes sense, and they change for reasons. And the mm. sort of the surprise after four years of something is is a real genuine shock. Yeah, the the one I think I think they probably had a bit of a mistake with this you should have had more cedric diggory in the first three books you only saw him very rarely because mm-hmm. his death didn't hit as hard I as it should have him, done yeah. <laughs> because you only saw him very, mostly in this book and he was sort of an other he wasn't part of the He's sort of introduced so he could be yeah. heroically killed so his yeah. death wasn't his death wasn't as impactful as it could have been or should yeah. have been. i mean you do get a general sense that i'm looking at a sort of rope that's been chopped neatly in front of me and there's strands all over the place there's a lot else going on you've got the whole serious back thing and i vaguely remember gary oldman in a previous film or something he, mm-hmm. he was like a werewolf or i don't know but he's sort of hovering around the sidelines and sort of acting as a kind of protector but doesn't really show up or do anything um and then you got the whole sort of hermione liberating the house elves you know trying to trying to free the house elf from slavery Slavery type thing and Dobby's there and going on about socks and you know, there's, so, there's so many other things oh and this is remember this from a previous book well look is it still going on I guess you know this is perhaps the major peril of coming in on a series midway through which is what I'm seeing certainly from where I'm looking at it but but then you, it, it was nominated as a book in itself if the Hugo don't have a yes. series category Absolutely. so this is this is this is my sort of kind of has to stand on its own yes it? although obviously you can bring on your own judgment around but this is sort of how I'm trying to approach these. If it's a Hugo winner, these these books are theoretically judged on their own merits. But if this had been badly written, it was too long to get through. It would yeah. have been a real struggle to get through. And for all the fact that it was too long already and there are bits I don't like, it's mm. actually pretty easy to read a page flows, of this. Yeah, without, yeah. yeah there, it there does. Is, there, it just runs along. There is a technical along. skill to Rowling's writing that makes it not a chore to, to get through. I mean, 650 pages. If it, Yeah, as mm-hmm. you say, if it, was, if it was all, you know mini exposition well, every paragraph or yeah, a, a, all a these new, and new long name every and, and, yeah. and, and she doesn't fall the names down the name trap either yeah yes. exactly the names are, are, are slightly odd and eccentric and silly but quidditch you could they, they, quidditch. They, they there's, there's not hundreds of, yeah. of them no but it, you can you can stick to a name and re- and remember who it is and, it and pronounce fits it after yeah yes. exactly I, yeah. I think some of that's because um, because we've had three books previously and because mm. she because she repeats the structure Quidditch has appeared Diagon Alley has appeared Flu Powder has appeared she, yeah. she, she's very good at, re- at repeating her, mo- her her motifs and making sure that they kind of they keep she 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 she, 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 she sort of layers on the world building and it, it's reassuring and calm and it's comfort it's it's like you know it's the previous set of last year's sl- slippers that are just nicely broken in and, and <laughs> yes. imagine you'd get a lot more out of it if you'd read the previous three yeah certainly but I, guy, guy gavriel k who's another famous sort of fantasy author not as successful once had the high king of the elves or the high so i can't remember mm. and his name was aileron <laughs> yes and that's a, that's a control surface did he know? on the yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and right. 
<laughs> so you can get names that, if you look at them, you think, well, that sort of works. It sounds well, a bit elfy. Is he married but, to Queen Oh, Rudder? God. That's, it's just, you can get names wrong very, very Prince easily. Too many, too many consonants, yeah. and you can't pronounce it, and suddenly yeah. it, fa- it fails. It, Even the f***ers in this, you can pronounce <laughs> their names. It's, of course, something that um, Tolkien did incredibly well, him being mm-hmm. a linguist. Yeah. And is something yeah. a lot of people have utterly failed at. A lot of people try and imitate Tolkien, and, but, and but, because but, he was a linguist and they're not. Yeah, exactly. But, but again, Tolkien, it, 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 this is a book, this is the fourth book of a series with a lot of repeating motifs and patterns and cycles. And you know, the, the words mm. we were introducing in book one, we're still using now. Yeah. T- Tolkien, we, we all four of us probably read it under the age of 10 or yeah. several times under the age of 20, or we may have. It, it, it's uh, Tolkien is almost a, it's a foundational thing. It's I think it's impossible to judge Tolkien's success in a meaningful way yes. because we've yeah. because we've seen it it's so like many times. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, yes and no, yes and no. Because if you look at his all the books he never published, which his son has now published to great oh. uh, well to no acclaim whatsoever. <laughs> uh, to, to Christopher God. Reanimator more, Tolkien. Yes. More unfinished um, so, yeah, they were unfinished those, for a reason. Yeah, exactly. And in those, he had an elf called Ting Fang Warble. <laughs> the names he put in the published yeah. works were better than the crap he came up with when he wasn't going to publish. <laughs> this is a, there's a reason editing exists. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think he didn't what? actually write. He didn't publish that much, did he? I mean, it was a, no. Or what, one one child book. Of and, that's stupid. Yeah. I can't go with that. And then sat down and had another go. Yeah. And Lord I, of the Rings, which to, compared to most fantasy these days, is really small beer word wise. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that uh, Rowling did here is what uh, names like Dumbledore. Is yes. actually a real word. Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it meant Bumblebee back in the 18th century or something. Oh, right. And so they have that feel of, yeah, they do exist because they do exist. Yeah, words that people have actually said a lot in the past. Yeah. One thing I, I one that baffles me slightly about the structure, and this kind of Possibly goes to the you know the sheer length of it is that you know the the, the Triwizard Tournament is structured such that um, visiting schools come at the start of the year and stay and there all year and they, they stay for a two parties and three sort of competing events so mm. so they can travel to Hogwarts but they for some reason it's never really explained they can't travel back they can't commute um, okay fair enough but then it's all supposed to be part of um, sort of um, ma- promoting magical cooperation that's yes. allegedly the, um, the the purpose and then you, you see some of the characters interacting particularly at the you know, Yule Ball and things like that where there's a mm. bit of bit of sort of cross school fraternisation going on in the bushes but there's <sighs> What do the rest of all of those swaps, sort of like 30-odd visiting students, do during the rest of the year? You almost never see them. They sit yeah. patiently yeah. in their little carriage yeah. and yeah. Their, their weird ghost ship it, until they're acquired. No, yeah. In terms of they, opportunities for character development, there's there's no normal day-to-day. They don't integrate those foreign it, students it is just in the day-to-day. Year day. Hogwarts, as far as yeah. I can tell. But. They just appear at major events and then mysteriously disappear. <laughs> now, obviously, if she decided to put in that background, which I think would have been really good, uh, but it would have got even longer. So the, there's, there's have, that kind of Harry and the yeah. gang go off on an exchange to one of these other no, schools. Who do you focus on? Yeah, unfortunately, what happens to those lot is they're stuck in the boat or the caravan for a year being mm. taught by their headmaster or headmistress. Yeah. <laughs> they don't who, appear in any of the lessons, do they? There's, there's no, no sort of <laughs> no, none of the meals, I think. No, because yeah. they don't want to be taught Hogwarts ways, because those are, you know, they're not they're not the proper ways. Mm. So they're taught by their headmaster and headmistress. Because Dumbledore could certainly teach every subject in the. It strikes uh, me as some kind <laughs> of annoying polymath. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So probably the same with the others, I'd guess. Mm. <clears throat> so so, so they're, they're kind of those schools for all the fact it's supposed to be about you know coming together and learning about each other and there's a couple of threads on that front you know the um, mm. the I, i'm not i'm not a half giant i'm just big boned oh that, um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 there's there's a lot of othering there that they don't actually the structure of the book doesn't try to break down doesn't try to introduce you very much to the opposing students i mean crumbs character a little bit um you know the, the, there's some moments focused on mm-hmm. 
you know, on the competitions where they try and actually give I, you a reason I, to root for the other other students and yeah. why they care, you know, their, their sister I, is being chat. Uh, I got the feeling that the, the idea of this magical corporation was sort of airy-fairy nonsense by Dumbledore that isn't actually the reason the other two sh- schools turn up. They just want to be able to get one over on Hogwarts. They want it to be best. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And so the the sort of claimed me- meaningful reason for all this that Dumbledore probably truly believes <laughs> is nothing to do with how anybody else uh, views this thing. It's sort of it's sort of um, battle royale. It's sort of blood, you know, kill, yeah. kill or be killed. But then on the top schools. of that, you've got the scheming that's going on on Voldemort's part because the entire thing, it, it seems like mm-hmm. it's designed just to be a massive setup just to get Harry Potter out of the school so he can nick some blood. So, yeah, <laughs> the whole thing's quite shaky. I got uh, another another structure element just because I, I have to say it just because hmm. it's there is that uh, uh, Harry Harry Potter at the start of the books here here it's not quite Harry Potter is in in a closet okay in a cupboard under the stairs yeah. for for the prequel and then comes <laughs> out of the closet and, and lives his life you know the, the, there's a there's a wiz, there's a wizarding as other status you know, uh-huh. wizarding as queer sort of motif yes. there that she's intentionally used that that she's I don't you know, know, that's Harry, quite subtle I can't see it yeah quite, quite <laughs> literal closet under the, head, under the stairs closet, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and it well. comes out and he, and he so, socializes with his 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 true friends. He can be his true self, and mm. and that I mean that that's kind of speaks to I mean just as you said, Roald, Roald Dahl kind of stories. The you know child being oppressed and it can only be them truth their true selves with their friends or out or wants to be saved from yeah. the terrible parents and, yeah, and, yeah. and so it's it's a common motif but it's it's kind of amusing that she does put a closet more or less <laughs> in in right at the start she, she she doesn't deal with any queer issues up up until you know um Dumbledore's posthumous um announcement that actually he was gay all the time oh obviously of course I can read that it's a bit post hoc but mm. anyway, at least she thought to do it but uh, mm. it's a, it's it's an it, it's all the way through through because everybody's othering each other. You know, the students, Hogwarts students are othering Dormstrang. You've got the um, all the Slytherins, you know, uh, preaching sort of you know racial purity and all this the, the mud blooding and all the oppression. So na- such Nazis, all of them. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's it, one way or another. It's it's a bit of a fascist police, uh, fascist wizard state that's go, that's going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, varying um, levels of, of of people buying into. It. I mean, there's yeah, the, 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 the dementors. Us, but... Yes, your your police your police are the dementors. Sorry, dementors. <laughs> What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, you know, you've, you've got the, you've got a, a, a kind and fluffy. Oh, isn't it jolly? You know, golden syrup, Stephen Fry esque world service sort of noise to it. But mm. at the same time, underneath, behind it, it's really, you know, it's really quite horrible. What's going on? The yeah. structures, e- even on the good side, as you, you said, Torag, the good guy, the, who said the wizards were the good guys? Some of them are, but the structure mm. isn't necessarily. And it's happening on so many levels as well. So you've got, so you got wizards versus muggles, you've got muggle, you know, wizards versus mudbloods, which is like even within the wizarding, there are the I look down on him because he's not pure wizard. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the whole elf slavery angle. No one bats an eyelid mm-hmm. that these, hell, these these house elves are required, not allowed you've clothes. Also, you've also got the class thing because uh, Malfoy and uh, the Weasleys because you know, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're both pure bloods, but you know, he's rich. That just seems to be a rich, and not rich type thing. You got the Hogwarts versus Bow Battles versus Drumstrang thing. You got Hagrid's ancestry; he's half giant, so everyone thinks he's likely to go mad and start killing everyone every every so often. And the headmistress of the French place turns out to be one and is in denial about that as well. And <coughs> there's a lot of adult themes in there. Yeah, it's all very behind honest. the facade of of Stephen Fry pouring golden syrup everywhere. So it's it's, it's actually really really clever. Uh, a, a lot of it, the fact, or, or she's very brave because she doesn't do a lot of you know clever writing about about there's not a lot done with it it's all pointed out and observed at least this is wrong and then they get on with the thing no one no one yeah but at least at least it's there it's there and it it does develop i know the elf stuff uh, the the spew stuff does develop later you know and dobby and what have you does 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 recur doesn't it how many kids came out of this sort of subtly better just nicer people because of it all, because of all of these all, things. All in throughout the this entire book, you, you, you're subtly being taught that you know being prejudiced and looking down on people is wrong. Yeah, maybe some of that sink, sinks in. So, is this a kids' book? What do we think? I mean, when I when I when I, when I ordered it, Amazon said it had a reading age of nine to twelve, and I thought, mm. but, did you uh, buy the adult or the uh, kid cover? I don't know. It, it just it's got a massive sort of orange cover with a swirly dragon on it. I don't think I'd be able to get away with sitting on a train with this it one. It's evolved and consolidated the, uh, the <laughs> yeah. I, I think I have released. the child version. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I've got, it doesn't look like a Twilight book. No, it's not when it's released, they had a specific cover for adults to buy. 
Yeah, what's well, so which was on the black train. and a logo. I think. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's both. It is a kids' book, mm-hmm. but it's also one that it has enough in there for an adult to read as well, and mm-hmm. that's why it was so successful. It sort of this, appeals to all audiences this on several has levels. To be the highest selling Hugo winner by far. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've, got one of the highest selling selling. I've got none of the yeah. sales numbers. It's, it's sort of anything, behind the Bible, isn't it? And uh, she, she sold literally hundreds of millions of, of books. Certainly as a series, yeah. I mean, this particular one it almost certainly outsold all the other nominees that year, certainly. Yeah, sold, she, she, she definitely blew out of her uh, out of a genre niche that she claims not to be in. I think she's outsold yeah. Tolkien. It's entirely possible, yeah. yeah. And do the Harry Potter movies did they make more money than the lord of the rings uh omni psychology i think they probably did yeah <laughs> they got in total, total up yeah. there certainly yeah and so she's one of the few billionaires you aren't allowed to because they've got there on the 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 work of the slave race below her because <laughs> it's all down to you know New all money. her <laughs> money is stuff that she's got for her own work ah, she's also one of the few billionaires who's no longer a billionaire because she gave her money gave away. away yeah yeah oh, fair play so, so Seema, generally, genuinely good egg and... And pays yeah. tax. So I've also written here in my rhetorical <laughs> questions section, uh, should this be a Hugo? So that was one of the things. I mean, it's it's a fine book in many in many regards and probably ought to be a winner of a great many literary awards. But what is it doing here? I mean, she said in the past in, in, in various interviews that she she doesn't read fantasy or science fiction. So mm. she, she she doesn't really, uh, and I think she's modified her um, and softened her position slightly, but she doesn't consider herself as writing fantasy, um, mm-hmm. which you can kind of see because the scaffolding, um, the bones of the boarding school drama are actually almost more important than all of the magic. The magic is the gateway drug that got people in on book one, that got the kids <laughs> going, isn't it great? Wizards? But there are some more serious down-to-earth but that stories being told. Yeah. provides the mm. scaffolding, and, and it's, it's that's almost sort of tangentially relevant to the actual, I think, for the fantasy yeah. and literary well, sci-fi. Yeah. Also, the Hugo Award for Best Novel is awarded for the best science fiction or fantasy story of 40,000 words or more published in the prior calendar year. It is for f- science fiction or fantasy. It's mostly science fiction that wins mm. because it's at a science fiction convention that it's voted on. But looking at... The other sort of come as as it's sort of one of the retro Hugos, but mm. the Sword in the Stone won a retro Hugo. Th-Y, now you can't, yeah, yeah you can't something. imagine. You can't really describe that as a science fiction. That's not novel. So, well, uh, I mean, I got there. I've written down here what is science fiction anyway. But I mean, you know, we probably don't have another hour. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the definitions are quite nebulous things. I mean, is fantasy mm-hmm. a subset of f- science fiction? Well, the, the, there's, know, a, there's a speculative fiction no, in the no, Hugo it's... categories section. There's a science fiction, fantasy, horror, and it says while the world of, uh, world science fiction society sponsors the Hugos, they are not limited to SF. Mm. Works of fantasy or horror are eligible if members of world think they are eligible. There is no strict So the reason this no one is because a large number of Worldcon nominee you know, attendees nominated it and voted yeah, yeah. for it. And it has to be remembered that this was a phenomenon, <clears throat> a legitimate, massive phenomenon. It had, it has, yes, has got the feel of, I mean, I've written, is this a case of exterior fandom hijacking the award or do sci-fi fans just no, fancy something lighter it, for it, a change? It was no, internal they, fandom as well. It was popular yeah. with everybody. Just everyone loves yeah. it, including the sorts of people who've nominating yeah. those because but the nomination science numbers. fiction is a form of fantasy so people who like science fiction some only like science fiction but mm. some like fantasy and science fiction yeah, it's certainly like, not like uncommon the, the only person you have to justify the nomination on the hugo ballot to is yourself and that there is no policing of it so it's mm. uh, so of, of the was it of the nominations for novel of 381 nominating ballots um of which there were 205 nominees harry potter got 56 nominations and, the, and that's the, a small number actually the, thinking yeah, about me recently second to fifth place 53 48 29 28 so there, there's a decline <clears> there but it's not like it's not like hundreds of people stormed out and nominated harry potter in it so and this, this wasn't some massive internet campaign or you no, know everyone, everyone no, on the no, festival no, 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 that's just all a bunch being of rallied yeah. just just it's, yeah just what people it's a, a bunch of people who 
the science fiction convention looked at the list and thought, well, of those, no, there's no question that Harry Potter's the best. So what the other options were what? George R. R. Martin's A Storm of Swords. That's a, a, mid, um, a middling instalment of the Game of yeah, Thrones. Quite. Yeah, which, which, is, which, is, which is when it started oh. to get really popular around that book <laughs> yeah. is when, when it was genuinely I've successful. I've read Storm yeah. of Swords and I can't remember anything about it. You know, I mean, I've, I remember the entire series. I've got that massive collection of them all and, and it's, it's somewhere in the middle and I can't remember any specific events from it. So, I mean, if you're a fan, and you'll have been reading them all anyway, but that one, you know, more than much Doesn't more than Harry Potter than wouldn't be others, a good yeah. standalone, yeah. I don't think. No. And the the others were Calculating God by Rob J. Sawyer. Mm-hmm. No, know nothing about it, no. means nothing to me. <laughs> the Sky Road by Ken McLeod. Well, I I know of Ken McLeod, but yeah, it, that's not a book that lives long in the and Midnight's Robber by Nalo Hopkinson. I've never no, heard I'm afraid. <laughs> Not even the publishers have heard because it's Warner Aspect. Warner the Aspect. Other two at all. Uh, Jamaican yeah, Canadian. Never heard of the publishers. Uh, okay. <laughs> so well, I'm also, afraid this, this was the there's year, only one winner. Yeah. Also, mm-hmm. this is the year where the film was coming out. And mm-hmm. don't forget that there it was a very fantasy type time because also all the hobbits uh, the, the lord of the rings stuff the was bubbling over the in the background then, yeah. uh, film-wise. It felt like fantasy was making a massive comeback. Yeah. So there was definitely an appetite for the film and obviously for the novels yeah, the too. The movie Philosopher's Stone came out in uh, uh, November the 16th, 2001. So it, it was after the yeah. the, the um, Hugo was uh, was nominated, but it would have been a part of the overall buzz. Yeah. Mm. So the she was nominated in 2000, the year before, for Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, a much then, better book. And then yeah. just... Yeah, that was actually won by Werner Vinger Deepness in the Sky, which I'll, we'll we'll do another another time. But that was very yes. that's very good that one. Fair enough, um, that yeah, yeah, uh, that one deserved to win. But and then after that, nothing. We don't see any more Harry Potter's in the nominations ever after. There was four, three more published after Goblet of Fire, but yeah. no more visits to the Hugo's for J.K. Rowling. So it's, it's, it's this got feeling perhaps of we've we've given her her dues now we can move on or you know had people gone off the boil at that point well, the year I, I after think, was American Gods by Neil Gaiman I think uh, the way it comes onwards. down to it is nominations yeah. you know it, these things have to be nominated and people are more likely to nominate you know American Gods or something rather than the next J.K. Rowling because you know, it's one already yeah yeah, yeah. there's a sense well, that, to be yeah, fair, somebody American else has turned out really not science fiction. <laughs> No, no, that's so, magical realism, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can't wait to moan about that book. <laughs> <laughs> so we probably ought to wrap up then. Um, so, uh, Tarek, what, what do you, what's your overall summing up notes there then? Uh, I, uh, n- <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> In a sentence. I like, I like the book. It's just, I like the, the setting. I enjoy all the books and mm. just, yeah, glad to go back and read just an easy to read book. Could have been half the size, but other than that, it does feel like light relief compared to some of the yes. stuff we've we've seen in this major list. Yeah, days. What's your overall takeaway? I, um, I made the mistake, perhaps, of listening to the audiobook, and that was um, dominated okay. by Stephen Fry's voice. So uh, that's it's, another it's, dimension. When I was trying to golden syrup, it, it, I think he, he's been directed <laughs> in full-on world service, cheery, breezy Stephen Fry. But then I, I, after I finished it, I went back and sort of read read a couple of segment, segments just to get because you know, I have have actually. I read it in the past, and just to get an idea of how it felt with, yeah, with my yeah. internal monologue, and it's very, very different. It's a lot drier, or there's the opportunity to be dry. You're not quite forced to that emotional state. So I, I, I genuinely think it's a better book read than it is uh, listened to because you haven't got you know golden yeah, syrup over yeah. everything. Um, so I, 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 I do find myself in two minds. Part of me uh, wants to do two fingers to J.K. Rowling, and here's your fantasy. Um, <laughs> part, part of me enjoyed reading the prequel, um, the um, Wizard of Earthsea, which was which is a very good prequel <laughs> to the book. Uh, and part of me really just enjoy, genuinely enjoyed the book for the, the the glorious escapist romp with with a couple of nice sort of writing points through it. I, I don't. It doesn't feel to me like a hey guys, this is incredible genre defining <laughs> literary visionary, is it? No. literary fantasy sci fi. But at the same time, it doesn't all have to be. It, this yeah. can be just be a bloody good fun book, and I think that's what it is. Yeah. And John? It's a book I can't hate because there's too much good about it, and it's a book I can't love because there's too many things wrong about it. But it is a book which always sits in that nice, comfortable, yeah, it exists, I'm glad it exists kind of place. Mm, yeah. I mean, my takeaway, I suppose, yeah, it, to me it felt like a bit a nice little holiday 
<laughs> from reading you guys because I've, I've come to expect and sort of re- read these 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 award winners as massive visionary glimpses of the future or the past or, or worlds that have never been and and they've all got to be earth shaking and they've all got to stun and this this didn't but it was nice it was it was accessible and enjoyable light read i think yeah with with some some nice nice sort of d- deeper parts i think worth a look i think you probably would get more by starting at philosopher's stone and going through them in order though i think i did suffer somewhat from coming in at the middle i would recommend you go back and read philosopher's stone if you get the chance i may yet read my way through the whole lot in the end i, I think possibly if there's nothing else you guys have converted right. me yes i, I, I was going <laughs> to say are you more likely to read the others now that you've read one of them Yes, or you are. Okay. I mean, well, the film, that's, that's I bounced something. off the films. The films were just so much colour and noise, and Daniel Radcliffe, and you know, and and look, celebrity cameo. Here's another celebrity cameo, and you sort of lose what the actual thing itself is. I think with the films, whereas the books, much more direct experience. And yeah, I think I probably probably uh, will go and work my way through them all. But not, of course, first until I've read next week's book. Hey, see what I did there? Well, next, uh, month, next week? Uh, next, month, month, yes. month, <laughs> month. Please, oh, please, okay. not next week. I thought week. we would just, just do this every week now. Uh, all right. Uh, in next month, we're going to be looking at uh, Philip K. Dick's 1963 uh, Hugo winner, Man in a High Castle. Uh, Can you it tell it's my choice? Or a this is picked up for us by, by John here, yes. So, uh, with that, we'll wrap up. Uh, see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. I have to say goodbye. <laughs>